thanks everybody for popping in monday holiday i think for most people is it a holiday for you guys Preeti? i don't even know what the difference between a work day and holidays <laughs> right i kind of do the same thing every day so i don't <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah supplements and pre-workouts so that'll be an interesting one i think it'd probably be good to share your personal journey uh Preeti, because i would imagine like most people, you know, you probably use supplements at some point. I did too. I still use some. Yeah. And I'm sure people tuning in would be curious to know which we're still taking, if any, and why. And what about the others that we used to take and stopped? Yeah. So I think, I guess like uh, there's supplements like vitamins and stuff like that and minerals. And then there's like pre-workout. And so there, I would say let's, we can separate the two. Okay, so with supplements, I think the most obvious thing that I have to say about supplements is like never rely on supplements as sort of to fill your nutritional needs. They are supplements for a reason because they're supplemental. Supplements. Um, yes, you should get most of your, uh, try to get all of your nutrients from food. And only if you can't meet that for various reasons, then you supplement. And so popular supplements that people try to take it and take during COVID, for example, are like vitamin D quercetin, vitamin C, um, zinc, uh, all of these are like vitamins and minerals that really help with immunity. So a lot of people start to take them in excessive amounts. And I think the reality is when you isolate a vitamin in that way, it's not like when you look at foods, for example, the vitamins we get from food, they never come in like isolated forms. They always come in combination with other minerals and other vitamins and so that our body knows and is basically evolved to be able to absorb these nutrients alongside the other nutrients that come in foods when we isolate them in pill form or supplement form it's unclear it's kind of like throwing a dart and trying to figure out whether that mineral will actually get absorbed by the body sometimes it will sometimes it won't and so you might just pee it out so it's kind of like a hit or miss and I found that like nothing replaces food. Correct. Yeah, right. Like, definitely. I mean, and like for me, like, I mean, even now, like, actually, I've been taking, a, for me more recently, I added, I added in the last six months, I added a bunch of new supplements for two reasons. One is I was trying to get to the bottom of a hormonal thing and I was trying to figure out like why my body was producing more cortisol than I wanted it to and taking supplements. I think it helped a little bit, but it was, it was probably 80% food and then 20% the supplements mm -hmm. for me to slowly reduce the cortisol. So I was taking like adaptogens, for example, things like maca root and like an adaptogen blend that I was taking um, that really helped. And so I'll take it on and off depending on where I am, like with my health, but it's like, you should never make supplements, your main source of, of food. And unfortunately, a lot of people do that. Now, when you first started uh, yeah. training, and then also when you first started resistance training, what was your view of supplementation at the time? Supplements or pre-workout? Both. Pre-workout, I used to take pre-workout every workout for years. I did that probably for three, four years. Even before I was lifting, I was doing like, you know, those five-hour energy shots? Yeah. I would do like half of that okay. before like a cardio session, like yeah. a half or a third. Um, and so I was doing some kind of like energy boosting thing before my workouts, like um, for a long time. And it wasn't until probably the last three months that I completely cut it all out. And like, I just realized like, I didn't, I didn't need it. Like I was like, I, I, I like, I just don't need it. Cause I eat enough. Right. Um, Whereas like before, I think I was like, I also gained like 15, 20 pounds in the last year. So um, I just have a like inner increase of energy. Like I'm not in a deficit anymore. I'm probably in a mm -hmm. surplus. And so I, and I'm fat adapted. I can, mm -hmm. I'm very good at using my fat um, as a fuel source. And so mm -hmm. for me, I just found that I don't need pre-workout. And then I also heard that like a lot of these pre-workouts have like really horrible additives in them and mm -hmm. like colors and just preservatives. And I was like, why, why consume that every day when I just don't need it? Right. Um, right. And if I'm feeling low energy, that probably means I need to fix my sleep or fix my diet and, and right. fix rather than um, seeking out like pre-workout. So my routine has definitely changed. I used to buy PE science like routinely and have it before my workouts and during my workouts and 
these days I just go completely free and just, I just have electrolyte tablets and that's enough. Yeah. And I think, you know, my, my experience getting into the supplement and pre-workout game would probably be somewhat similar to a lot of the, the people, particularly the men joining where, yeah. you know, when I, I first started lifting weights as a freshman in high school. So I was 14 years old and, you know, my dad is like a risk averse person is like, okay, we need to like ask the doctor if it's okay for you to lift weights. And then what about these protein shakes? We should ask the doctor if it's okay for you to take that. And the doctor said it was probably fine for me to lift weights and eat like a protein bar a day or something. So, you know, back then when we were in high school, uh, protein supplements tasted like shit. And so I would eat these just horrendous looking or horrendous tasting protein bars because I thought, you know, my friends did it. Right. And so a lot of times when you're new, you just look at to what other people who are more experienced than you in, a, you know, in, in your proximity do. And so my friends who lived in the weight room were also consuming supplements. So I got that stuff too. And uh, I took protein shakes or protein uh, bars as well as shakes for a few years when I was in high school. But I really didn't start to make serious gains in muscle mass until I just decided I needed to eat more calories. And so if you look at my physical progression through high school, you know, I was an athlete. So I had, I had lean muscle mass and I looked like I could move, but it wasn't until my senior year when I started eating like 5,000 calories a day that I gained like 20 pounds of lean mass. And so nobody's eating 5,000 calories a day of protein shakes uh, or protein bars. And if you're eating that much like weight gain or like you should consider eating real food. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I never really drank coffee until I got to be like a senior in college or just out of college. And, um, you know, once I started drinking coffee, I realized like running is a lot more enjoyable when I'm caffeinated. And a lot of the approach that I take is like, let me figure out how to make this hard thing like training, um, not so hard. And, you know, based on what I'd read uh, at the time, as well as what I'm aware of now, uh, you know, adding caffeine before runs wouldn't add risk to some sort of, you know, cardiac situation or, um, you know, maybe it could dehydrate you if you're not, if you're not smart about drinking enough water when you do it, um, and you're sweating a lot in your workout. But, uh, as far as the downsides of caffeine, uh, you know, there, there aren't that many that we're aware of a lot of the ones that people previously thought, um, you know, the, the science community has kind of shifted their perspective on that. Yeah. And to be fair, they can shift back at some point too, but you know, from a pre-workout standpoint, Black coffee is going to be just as functional of a pre-workout as most pre-workouts that you would buy. It's a lot more accessible. You can you know, buy gallons at a time. And so you just like, I just drink that. Totally yeah. fine for me. Interesting. Never took NO Explode. Though some people will swear by that. And a lot of my teammates would take it in college. But, you know, everything that, that you've seen from me has come only using coffee as a pre-workout. I don't know that maybe I've had a Red Bull or something like one time, but yeah. for the most part, coffee espresso is, this is the pre-workout of Alex. The official pre-workout of Alex is black coffee or espresso. Now, as far as supplementation goes, you know, so once I got out of college, I kind of, they stopped giving us protein shakes. Well, they gave us protein shakes at college. And once I got out, I was no longer given protein shakes. So I stopped consuming them as much. And started eating predominantly whole, you know, more whole foods. I would still actually have a protein shake after, uh, for breakfast for a while. But, you know, one thing I noticed is I started shifting to whole foods uh, and realizing like a lot of what I thought I needed to eat could be uh, more clearly directed if I just started eliminating processed foods from my diet. Everything kind of felt good. You know, I took a fish oil supplement just because that's, you know, people say, you know, most people are omega 3 deficient. So I took a fish oil supplement. I think I might have taken a multivitamins for several years, but nothing beyond that. So, you know, yeah. a lot of people on here might have seen like timeline pictures of me, you know, all the way from like 12% body fat down to like 6 or 7% body fat. My supplementation included multivitamins and, and fish oil. So if you go buy a Walgreens or something like that. Um, yeah. Now, to be fair, over the last couple of years, uh, you know, after turning about 32, um, I kind of came to the end of the road as far as what my genetic potential was going to deliver to me if I wasn't able to, you know, seek out small areas where I could get a half percent better here, a half percent better there. So since then, I started consuming creatine HCL. Um, and it's important to know the difference between creatine monohydrate, which is the more common one, and creatine HCL, which is the thing that I was taking before I forgot to take it for several workouts in a row and just never picked the habit back up. 
Creatine monohydrate is, uh, you know, trainers will say it's one of the safest supplements you can take and one of the only supplements that uh, studies show does work. Um, I took it in college and I got strong. I bench pressed 320 pounds while I was on creatine monohydrate. And then I pulled my hamstring a week later. And so I decided like, mm, you know, it doesn't seem to be that hamstring pulls are a known side effect of taking like a, a medically documented side effect of taking creatine monohydrate, but ask any trainer and they'll tell you that the guys who take creatine are more likely to you know, have, uh, have muscular injuries. And so I found out that creatine HCL does cause the water retention that creatine monohydrate does. It doesn't require that you drink uh, excessive amounts of water the way creatine monohydrate does. So I started taking that and I noticed that, you know, the difference was about one rep on a six rep max or something like that's a noticeable difference for a well-trained person being able to do something seven times instead of six, because your strength levels are pretty constant. Most of the times you're in the gym. So if you, if you get that extra rep, you notice the difference, but it's like one rep. It's not like 10, you know, this isn't like steroids or something like that. And, you know, more recently, uh, you know, supplement companies reach out to me because they want me to promote their products. And, you know, one of the uh, one supplement company that reached out to me gave me like really good whey protein. It was, uh, it was Which from company? Uh, Centenarius. Yeah. One of my uh, buddies, Shaw on Twitter uh, knows them. And, you know, so they sent me a, a pack and, you know, they want you were hoping I would like do posts, talk about how great it was. And I had the whole pack in a week. I felt fine. I didn't have any digestion issues. Um, I was drinking like two of those a day at night, but what I actually found was that, um, it was allowing me to be lazy with my food consumption yep. because late at night, you know, typically yep. if I only have real food, I'm basically going to be eating like steak or yogurt or something. Like I need to eat food if I'm going to get protein. And when I had those protein shakes available to me, I'm like, Oh, I'm a little bit hungry. I'll just go like have a protein shake or something. And that was fine for about a week. And then my lifts just started to suck and they started to suck because I was probably missing out on like 500 calories a day that I would have been food. eating. Yeah. If I had been just eating real food. Yeah. So, that's a really it, you know, good point. It, the, the supplement itself was great, but my use of the supplement made it not a good decision for me to continue using it, frankly, because I couldn't use it responsibly. Yeah. I had the same, um, experience like it's you don't notice the difference until you are completely fueled by food and not all of these like junk free workouts or, or supplements and all that like for years probably two years i would i was probably consuming like two to three scoops of pe protein a day and it, it, like you said it suppresses your appetite because it's purely protein and i would typically blend it with like some kind of plant-based milk and I could skip breakfast basically, and I can just have two meals. But mm -hmm. if I have a protein thing, and like I, and then now that I eat three meals, basically, I can notice a difference if there's a day where I only have that protein as my breakfast and then go skip, skip straight, straight to lunch. I can notice my lift suffer the next day, or I just mm -hmm. feel less energy. Yeah. So I totally agree. Like the calories from food do not compare to the calories from protein shakes. The only protein shake I yeah, like all of the even the protein shakes, they all still have so much junk in them. Like it's oh, very hard to get an unflavored protein shake. Well, I found one. Um, right, they exist, but yeah, they're very few and far between. Yeah, there's one called Naked Goat and it's goat way, and I like absolutely love it. I'll have it before a workout. The other pre-workout besides just food is honey. So I yeah. put honey in my shakes um, or milk. I'll just like mix honey and like milk. And it's like such a great pre-workout um, before cool, and though. after. Yeah, huh? that's more food. That's not you think so? Food. Uh, it's, I food. Think it's, yeah. it's food. <laughs> you don't, <laughs> it's true. They don't sell it at GNC. They sell it at like Whole Foods. Yeah, yeah. that's very right, true. Honey is food. Honey is like the best. Um Honestly, honey has been like a great source of carbs for me, especially mm -hmm. around when I'm working out. I probably get like 50 grams of sugar just from honey a day. It's insane. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> some people need it. You know, so for hard gainers in particular, like honey will amplify your hunger most likely. So if you're, if, if you find it to be difficult to eat that thousand calories that you're trying to eat, you know, the more honey you're eating, the hungrier you'll typically be, the easier it's going to be to consume those thousand calories. 
Yeah. And the glucose definitely helps. It's, it's just so easy. It's just like an easy source of sugar. But yeah, totally agree. What else about... There were some questions that came up. I think someone asked about creatine, but I think you talked about that. Yeah. Everyone says it's like the safest supplement. I've never tried creatine. I just... I don't feel the need to, to be honest. But it's the safest supplement. You can't go wrong by... If you want to... You can't go wrong by trying it out for a few weeks and seeing if you like it. Thoughts on plant-based or vegan? So we've talked about that in previous videos. <laughs> We don't, think Al- we don't like it. Yeah, I, I think Alex, asking me and Alex what we think about plant-based <laughs> will get you the answer you don't want to hear. Tell me like, how you're going to get 150 grams of protein without eating animals. Yeah, that's right. How are you going to do it? I mean, you huh. could take a bunch of protein shakes like we're talking about, but it's like... Vegan ones, too. Ugh. Yeah. The vegan like, ones are gross. Right. So, you know, if you go plant-based, you go vegan, you need to be applying way more effort to make sure that you're adequately proteined and you're probably going to be consuming more processed food than somebody who's simply consuming like steak. So it's not to say you can't be successful doing it, but your chances of succeeding are far lower um, when you're not eating animal products. I got a question privately that says, isn't sugar bad for you? I'm assuming because I was talking about how much honey I eat. So this whole demonization of sugar, I think we should talk about that in a separate stream. But I yeah. think I, I think it's pretty bad that we're like people are literally scared to consume sugar. It's completely blown out of proportion and completely out of context. Sugar is bad if you're metabolically unhealthy. If your body does not know how to process that sugar well because you are pre-diabetic or basically almost diabetic then yes, that sugar is going to be bad. And this applies to 40% of the American population. So it's not crazy to just think that it's bad. Bad. For four out of 10 people, it is bad. But for a healthy person, sugar is absolutely critical for you to function at an optimal rate because your brain uses sugar. Your Your body uses glucose as a primary fuel source for a reason because it's the easiest way to get fuel for your body. And so this idea that sugar is bad for you and you shouldn't have it is not true. It's excess sugar is bad, especially in diets where people are consuming more sugar than they are protein um, and fats. Like if you balance your protein, fats and sugar intake, then some amount of sugar is not going to be bad for you. In fact, if you're lifting, for example, or you're doing any kind of strenuous activity, you need that glucose you can go for some period of time just on fat. You can for a few months, maybe even a year. But after that, you'll start to see that your cortisol levels are just through the roof because the body likes to use glucose to fuel and regenerate and repair. And then when you deprive it of that, it your other hormones get elevated. Things like cortisol go up and it kind of messes with your adrenals. So highly recommend trying, not trying to like completely eliminate sugar if you're super active, especially for women um, yeah. as well. I, I think to add on to that, it's important to differentiate between natural sugar and processed sugars because yeah. most Americans consume way too many, too many sugars because they're eating processed food every meal of the day. So yeah, if you, like the 39 grams of sugar in a can of Coke, you can probably do without the eight grams of sugar per ounce of beef jerky that you're eating, you can probably do without. But if we're talking about fr- you know, sugar from fruit, you're having a smoothie, you're having a banana, you're having some honey, like these are completely different categories. This is like the difference between drinking coffee and doing cocaine, right? So you're not almost certainly not going to be over consuming sugar when you're eating it in its natural form. But if you get it in its processed form, you're almost certainly going to be over consuming it. And so that's probably one of the reasons why people um, feel the need to, you know, be on one side of the argument or the other, rather than taking a nuanced approach and saying, in these situations for these people, this thing is positive. In these situations for these people, it's negative. You decide what type of person you are and what your situation is to determine if that's the right thing for you at this point. And even if it's processed, as long as it's not excess, I think, I think you're you'll do fine like probably but right like i mean weight watchers works for a reason like you you can go eat a cheesecake from new york uh, cheesecake factory and like it'll be like 
30 something points or something. So like you, you can do it. Yeah. The, the point is, is what is practically easiest to execute. Right. So if you're going to, if, if you're careful about the processed sugar that you consume and you're like, oh, okay, this has 30 grams of it. I'm aware of that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's the first step towards responsibly consuming processed sugar. The challenge is if people don't put any barriers, they're probably not going to be tabulating those 30 grams. You're just going to eat it and they're going to like eat more of it. And so, you know, it just, it goes to like, can you consume it responsibly? Because if you can, it's probably okay. But most people through their actions have demonstrated that they cannot consume it responsibly. That's very true. There were some other questions. Pre-workout, a banana. That's another good work. I, I put yeah. a banana in my pre-workout too. So we got one on um, not eating meat, but eating milk and eggs. And I can touch on that real quick. So, you know, I eat about one and a half to two pounds of meat per day. That's going to be about 125 grams of protein in that uh, pound and a half to two pounds of meat. If you're trying to replace that with eggs, you have to drink like a half gallon of milk and nine eggs to replace that. So find me a vegetarian who's drinking a half gallon of milk and eating nine eggs a day. And I'll be like, okay, yeah, you're probably getting enough protein. I don't know anybody who's drinking a half gallon of milk and eating nine eggs a day. Um, there was a question that says, two-part question. What age did you both start going to the gym and working out? And when did you add supplements? I can start. So I was always a, a very, very active kid. So like I would spend 12 hours out of the day sort of playing outside. So like, I don't really, I think like just in general, I've always had like a very active lifestyle. I don't, I don't like sitting still for too long, but I really got into, and then in high school and middle school, I played a bunch of sports. I was, I was doing Taekwondo. I was doing swimming. I was doing tennis. So I was just active throughout my high school and middle school times. And then in college was when I started getting into running. And that's when I started to go to the real gym. So college was the first time I went to like a real gym because it was accessible to me. I didn't really have one in high school. And then, but I was doing mostly cardio at the time. And then I didn't really start lifting until 2017, probably. And then I started lifting. I mentioned this earlier. Um, I started lifting as a, uh, a freshman in high school. And at, about at the same time is when I started taking protein, sh- uh, protein bars. And so, you know, that was the only supplement that I took for my first few years of lifting was protein bars. Yeah. There's someone that said, you may not need that much protein if you can see, consume nutrient filled food. I truly beg to differ because you do need protein. Every cell in your body is made out of protein, and most people that follow a standard diet get not nearly enough protein. What do you, I don't even understand what it, what this person means by if you consume nutrient filled food. Like nutrients have nothing to do with your protein needs. <laughs> Alex, what's your story? Six to seven body fat. That's my goal. So uh, interestingly enough. Um, you know, I followed a conventional training plan after I got done playing sports. So I played uh, professional baseball and noticed that as a professional athlete and as a college athlete, people treated other people who are in shape better. So when I started my career, uh, not really knowing how to navigate the corporate world, I figured the one way I could ensure I had the wind at my back was to always be in good shape, always be in the best shape of everybody in the room. And so I trained regularly following like conventional training plans for years, uh, assumed that I wasn't going to get like super lean because I never had like solid abs or anything growing up. And then I, I had a couple tweaks to my training that weren't supposed to work according to modern exercise science, but they did. So I just kind of rolled with them to see like, hmm, this thing that isn't supposed to make me lose fat is I'm going to keep doing it. And then I just kept dropping fat from 12% to 9% to 8%, to 7% and lower. And, you know, and then I started creating a a Twitter account and Instagram account, kind of documenting the types of food I was eating and the types of training I was doing. And, um, you know, came to realize that Preeti's journey was very similar to mine in terms of, you know, both of us started believing a core set of ideas and through years of experimentation and application came to believe that those ideas were not true, found, uh, you know, more optimized program for each of us, that happens to align very closely with what we independently discovered 
And so if two people are independently discovering the same thing, there's probably a there there. <laughs> a there there. Any supplements you've personally found that help with injuries? Uh, I take boron, which is supposed to help with like arthritis or something. I have a bad left shoulder. So, you know, I take that. I have, you know, I've taken Advil, you know, ibuprofen, naproxen. I don't take that stuff regularly anymore, but I, there have, mm-hmm. have been times that I've, uh, that I've taken it, you know, outside of that sleep, yeah, like anything that can sleep. help you sleep deeply is something you should consider. Cause like sleeps when your body repairs itself. Yeah. Um, the other thing I've liked is like high quality collagen or just having bone marrow. <laughs> Not a supplement, um, but yeah. It's bone marrow. For someone, woman who's getting started with workout, what workout would you best recommend cardio or running or weights? Okay. So cardio and running, I mean, I'm going to bucket those as the same thing. So you're saying like, should you do cardio or should you do weights? Um, I think you should definitely, I'm biased. I think weights have helped me mentally and physically in ways that are just really, I don't know. It's just like super gratifying um, because especially for women, this, this feeling of getting stronger is very empowering. And I think every woman should lift weights, especially because as we get older, we lose muscle mass. And so that's the first thing we lose. And the older we get, the more muscle mass we lose. And that's what causes us to have injuries as we get older or feel weak and have broken bones and broken hips and things like that. And so the more muscle you build, the better you'll age. And I, I know women love to look young. And I know that lifting definitely has like, it's given me a sense of like glow and vibrancy that I didn't have when I was just doing cardio. And then I would say for cardio, it's like, it's still important to do a little bit, but like you can get that by just walking, you know, 30 to 60 minutes a day um, in the morning or evening or whenever you have time you don't need to necessarily use like the elliptical to get your cardio in. I think like you can get that by just walking. Would you add anything? Um, yeah. You know, if, you, if, if you're just starting yeah. out, you're probably going to be intimidated by a lot of the um, weight yeah. lifting that you see and your body's not necessarily going to be even ready for it. So, you know, what I, I think that every adult, should be able to do a hundred yards of walking lunges without stopping. Now, most people cannot do that when they start training, you know, they like 10, 20 yards of walking lunges is hard for most people when they start training. But um, if you can get yourself to the point where you can do a hundred yards of walking lunges without stopping, you're going to find fat loss to be a lot easier because you have at least some degree of muscle mass in your lower body um, that's going to power your metabolism. Um, so that is certainly a path to consider. Like you don't need to lift weights to do resistance training. When you're just getting started, your body's going to be heavy enough for a lot of movements. Yeah. It's the body weight stuff. And like in terms of the intimidation factor, that's very real because most still, even to this day, majority of the people in the weight room are men. Um, and so that can be very intimidating for women. I would say if you can afford it, um, get a, get a good trainer. Don't get any trainer, make sure he's good and knows what he's doing so that you can get like used to the idea of being in the weight room. Um, and then eventually you'll feel comfortable going alone. Um, or, uh, buy a program from someone that you trust that is like a fitness person. A lot of women who are on Instagram, who are professional fitness people, will have programs that they sell. So you can buy a program that they sell and just follow that week over week um, so that you don't have to design your own program. You can just follow a program that exists already. That's um, easier for younger people to do because the older you get or the, you know, yeah. if you have sports injuries, chances are some portion of your body doesn't work perfectly. And the program that's being sold is not designed for somebody with injuries. And so if somebody with injuries, uh, or with, it depends. You know, some, yeah, if you, if you look, you can find. Okay, but be, ca- yeah. be careful to yeah. look for that. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. Because they don't like, know your injury history. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's there's so much out there now. Like, there's, like, um, you know, pr- pr- 
programs that have like no jumping, for example, for people with bad knees or whatever, whatever. Um, not that you should be jumping in weight training anyway. But <laughs> that's besides the point. Um, also, you know, but be careful um, to actually like try to develop a relationship with the trainers that you're going to be working with because. You know, a lot of times when people see super fit people promoting products, they're not necessarily the products that they're actually using. So, you know, kind of going back to supplementation, when I was younger, um, you know, you, you look at people in like men's health, muscle and fitness or whatever, and they're like, this is Jason Seahorn's workout. And then you find out like 10 years later when you're kind of immersed in sports and fitness, they don't even, that's like not their workout. Some, some editor is just like, hey, is it cool if we put your name to this? Well, yeah, it's fine. And they just put it out there. It probably has twice the volume that they're actually doing because they're, they're you know, uh, crafting this persona of some machine who can just get through like two hour workouts. That's excessive. That's you'll get better results doing less. Yeah. Um, and you know, the same thing is true with, uh, with supplementation where a lot of these guys who are supporting different supplement lines, like they're taking anabolic steroids. So the supplements that they're taking are like 2% as effective as the needles that they're sticking in their butts. Um, and you might be thinking you're buying their results, but unless you're buying, you know, their testosterone and human growth hormone stack, you're not buying the thing that's actually differentiating them from anybody else you're looking at more times than not. Yeah. Um, the next question asks, best way to learn good form. Do you suggest any YouTube channels or articles in particular? Yes, this is a lifelong journey and learning how to do, for example, a proper deadlift, a proper squat, a proper hip hinge, all of these take time and practice. Um, I would say the best YouTube channel I found, one of the best, there's a few, are Athlean X has really easy to digest videos um, on YouTube that explain basically every exercise <laughs> that you can think of from deadlifting to squatting to like a bunch of upper body stuff, um, face pulls. He, he does, he has a video on everything. So I highly recommend you devouring his YouTube channel to learn about it. And, um, there's a few other niche channels that really teach you this stuff, but I would say start there. Um, and really get the form down. And then the other way to really improve your form is recording yourself um, and comparing it to um, people who are professionals in the field and who, um, for example, let's say Athlean X has a video on deadlift and he shows you how to do the deadlift and you record yourself doing a deadlift and it looks totally different. Then you probably know your form's off and you can kind of compare and figure out where you're going off. So getting form right is just like a lot of, trial and error and like just getting intuitive with your body. But, you know, a lot of times when people have mechanical issues with certain uh, aspects of the lift, it's because they have uh, imbalances in their own body. So you might look at a video on YouTube and say, my deadlift looks differently than that guy. And I don't know why. And a lot of times it, it could be, well, it's because your hamstrings and your glutes aren't strong because you sit at a desk all day and you only walk forwards and you're not doing anything to train the backside of your body. So your body mechanically doesn't have the foundational pieces to even execute that lift properly. Um, and that's what working with a good personal trainer one-on-one -on -one is going to teach you that you're probably not going to necessarily learn simply watching a ton of YouTube videos. How many times a week do you weight train? I do three or four. I, I do three now. I used to do more in the past. But I do three now because I don't, I have, um, I save the other days for dance and other things like yoga. And, and so I don't want to overdo my training. And so I limit it to three. Three days is really like the best. More than enough. Buck. Yeah. 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 I mean, like, especially for people in their thirties, like I could like, I could do four days a week, I could do five days a week. Like working hard is not the limiting factor. It's like, is it going to make me better? And how much additional effort is it for how much it's going to make me better? And I would say that, you know, as a younger person, 
you know, going from three days a week to four days a week is, you know, that's going to result in about 25% more training, not 33% because you do a little bit less workouts, a little bit less each session. But yeah, jumping from three workouts to, to four is, you know, 25% more effort probably got me 10% more output and jumping from four to five, you know, was at 15% more effort and 0% more output. Now that I'm 35, you know, jumping from three to four will add the same 20% of additional um, output for maybe like 1%, 2% extra, uh, or it's 20% extra effort for like 2% extra output. Yeah, if I have a lot of time, I can do it. But really like at this point, three to four is kind of the sweet spot where I'll just take do alternating. We'll even go on a seven day schedule, we'll go off an eight day schedule and go four days out of eight. Yeah. That's a good, a good payment. Is aggressively pushing supplements to the average citizen net positive? Oops. Given um, how little most people know about nutrition like myself. Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, I think you answered your own question. Because like the way here's you the deal. It, yeah. Here's the deal. If people don't know anything about nutrition, pushing supplements on them, they're going to be, they're going to buy bad supplements. If you don't know, if you don't know how to decipher between truth and, and falsehoods, there's a lot of people selling pills on the internet. Go buy a hundred of them. Tell me if any of them work, right? Like usually they're scams and, and maybe they're uh, some, uh, you know, you have a reputable brand or something. Okay. Well then they're, it still might be a scam. You just can't sue them for it because they have legal teams that make sure that their wording is careful enough to where, you, you know, there's nothing they can do is going to get them in real big trouble. Yeah. I actually heard that a lot of supplements or not a lot some supplements on Amazon are fake. So like, yeah, I mean, like there's like branded, like things that there's fake brand so like there's some brands that are not that specifically don't sell on amazon but you can find them on amazon because they're just like taking the used bottles and filling it with like fake supplements and selling yeah. those so be very careful and that's true with everything that you consume food too and yeah. so this is why you know this is one of the reasons why i, re I really like resistance training is because once you get your body to the point you know, maybe three years in where you're not making huge gains you know every month if something's off in your training, you can instantly understand that something's off. Whereas most people, their performance output is too variable for them to say, huh, I had a really good workout today. I wonder what I did to, to result in that. Or I had a really bad workout today. I wonder what's different. Where now, you know, most of my workouts feel about the same. And it's one thing if I didn't sleep well, I understand, okay, that's a pretty good driver for why it felt different. But if my sleep is constant and my workout feels different, then I know something's off. I'm either sick, dehydrated, or malnourished. One of those three things. Yep. If you skip, if you skip a day or two of training, if, is it best to train consecutive days to catch up? I mean, if you're training different muscle group groups, it's fine to train consecutive days. Like I just wouldn't recommend training a sore muscle or trying to train the same muscle group two days in a row. Unless make, it's like you don't feel soreness, I don't know. Make sure you have purpose and intent in your yeah. sessions. So if you can have back-to-back -back sessions with full purpose and intent, do it. Um, I know like if my if day one is deadlifts, my day two can't be too intense. Like I'm like the day after deadlifts, if I want to do some accessory movements, arms, something like that, calves, like okay, I can do that with full effort. But if I did deadlifts and then I'm going to turn around the next day and do like a full upper body workout, that workout's not going to be as good. I'll get more out of it if I wait another day, even if I took like three days off before the deadlifts. What age are you considered late to start doing weight, weights? Never? Dead. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great answer. I mean, I, I, there's a woman on Instagram. She like literally started lifting when she was 70 and now she's like 80. And she looks like super strong. So it's like never too late. Yeah. I mean, if you start 40s, 50s, that's probably like nearly ideal in some regards because you're not stupid. Like boys when they're 17 years old are dumb in the weight room typically. So you will not be doing like joint damage. You might not, your joints aren't as healthy as theirs because you're older, but you also know not to do dumb things the way a lot of teenagers don't know. Yeah. I totally agree. And like, it's, and like, what's his name? PD Mangan. I think he started pretty late too, right? He was probably yeah. like 60 or something 
when he started lifting weights. Um, and now he's like 70 uh, and looks better than he ever did in his entire life. So it's never too late. Yeah. Any other questions? I think that was it. Cool, guys. Thanks right. for tuning in. Bye. Bye.